Good morning. Welcome to the second day of our conference, Invisible Designs of Social Experience. Um, today, I would like to start with, the, uh, with our second keynote speaker. I would like to introduce Professor Monica Costera. Um, she is a titular professor in economics uh, and in the humanities and works of, as Professor Ordinaria at the Jagiellonian University in Poland. And she also teaches at the Sudertun University in Sweden. She worked and cooperated with a variety of universities from different countries, among others, the universities in uh, Durham, Leeds and Bradford in the UK, uh, Linnaeus University in Sweden and also University in Poland. She is the author, co-author and editor of over 40 books in Polish and English and of numerous uh, scientific articles. She has been the author of several scientific journals, for instance, European Management Review, British Journal of Management, Management Learning, and Journal of Management, Spirituality, and Religion. She coordinated several research projects, among, uh, among others, the uh, FP7 European Union project on value-driven uh, organizations. Her current research interests include organizational imagin imagination, Disalienated work and organizational ethnography. She also writes poetry and she is a member of uh, Erbacha Poets Cooperative. Uh, her newest book um, on uh, organizational imagination after the uh, acopal, uh, apocalypse, uh, finding hope in uh, organizing, is just to be published by uh, Zero Books. Uh, so now I would uh, uh, like to invite Professor Monica Costera to present her in a speech entitled Managing for the, Co uh, for the Common Good. Thank you so much for the, the introduction and for inviting me to this interesting and inspiring conference. I have been listening to the presentations yesterday and uh, they did bring up some really timely and, and relevant topics. Um, and I, I really believe that we should discuss all these issues and very intensely and, and think about possible future developments. Everything that has been said until now and the program for today looks quite promising as well. So my, my little contribution is uh, concerns the, the, the common good, also known as simply as the commons, especially in, in the, the British English area. Um, but in order to do that in order to, to tell to tell you share my, my, my reflections and ideas about the future and about urgent things that have to be addressed and and done being Polish uh, I will first turn to history and and tell you or, or start the story in the past and this is a past that some of us remember quite well. Myself, I, I, I've been brought up during this era, which uh, sociologist Zygmunt Bauman calls solid modernity. It's, it's been an era that dominated the, the, the last, the second half, especially the second half of, of the 20th century. And it was characterized by structures that the, the dominant entity that carried a lot of what people were doing together, a common effort, common, mm, or, well, organizing organizations and, and, and so on. And also social life and sociality itself was organized around solid structures. A social structure is uh, a pattern, uh, 
a repetitive pattern of action based on taken for granted assumptions about what to do together, how to do it, what the rules of individuals are in the common process of doing things together. And these structures can concern smaller social efforts such as, I don't know, family business or huge ones such as the state. And during that time, these structures, these, these constructs were quite powerful. With the, this had many effects. One of them was, uh, well, the, the faith in progress, because things tend to work quite well with these structures. Things that people did together tend to have massive effects. And this is also uh, quite visible in the, the, the 20th century, how, how uh, enterprises grew, how the state grew very powerful, quite, quite uh, uh, important solutions and mechanisms were introduced at that time. So when I grew up, when I was a kid, we tended to believe that things were growing better and better. That there was a, a, an underpinning narrative of progress. So from kindergarten and on, I was well inclined to believe that, of course, with our effort and with our help and contribution, society would improve, it would change gradually and slowly to the better. And that was supposed to be the, the effect of, of several important dynamics, including democratization. Of course, there were many problems, but the, as the narrative went, people protested, people organized, there were strikes, there, there were marches for women's rights. And look, it is better already, and it will be better in the future, much, much better. When I grow up, everything will be equal and democratic and beautiful. The, 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 the second main force, main dynamic that, that tended to, to uh, inspire us to believe that things were improving was science and technology. The, there were solutions that coming up to different problems that were until just 10 years earlier insolvable, that were impossible. Illnesses where people were, were finding, scientists were working for, uh, for a, to find a cure for, for illnesses and uh, epidemics were not as threatening anymore as they used to be just 100 years ago. And well, solutions to every problem to find them was the mission of science and of course of technology too, which was supposed to be the, the applied, applied side of science. So we, we were inclined to believe that ultimately science would find an answer to all the questions, especially all the, the, the important questions of humanity and there would be no more problems with irrationality because just as democracy science was irresistible and this was of course um, a cultural narrative mainly but it was based in the practices that we observed around us. There, there was some evidence that things were improving, that, that we indeed were witnessing and participating in social progress on a massive scale. However, being solid, 
these social structures were also tools of oppression, limiting the inclusive inclusiveness of society. Some of the, the members of modern societies were excluded from, well, some of their roles, social roles, some of the positions in society because they weren't considered good enough. And there were numerous oppressive institutions and we have totalitarianism, we have totalitarian states, which were also based in these solid modern structures. They could do that and so they did. And there was, of course, the the mass murder of historic scale of the two world wars and especially the second world war which was strictly organized on the basis of solid structures so these solid structures on the one hand enabled effective organizing for a better future of society but on the other hand they also enabled misery, oppression, totalitarianism and violence. The small wonder when these structures started to erode in the 1980s, a lot of people were quite optimistic. They embraced the change. However, the new era, which sociologist Sigmund Bauman calls liquid modernity, quite soon revealed its other face. And uh, it turned out that the, the erosion of social structures meant a loss of something, of something very important, which most of all, I think, like a, a, the, a first cultural element, tendency that started to be more and more visible was a loss of faith. People lost the faith in progress. The narrative of things improving was not as compelling anymore as it used to be. In fact, it got less and less compelling as time developed and in the 1990s we we already had a, a strong philosophical tendencies speaking of well postmodern deconstruction and so on without solid structures we we lost stability so we have a problem with instability a fragmentation of society. We were told there is no such thing as society. And it was a, a kind of a performative declaration by which the social structures were systematically dismantled and all agency was located within the individual sphere. Everything was privatized and individualized and fragmented. And this caused uh, a loss of relationships and because society is based on relationships the career of society is the relationship and there, are, there are many elements that have to play together in order to establish strong relationships when we lose that we cannot commit ourselves we, the, the human relationships that used to be the carriers of solid structure got dissolved. That there are no such thing as solid relationships anymore. People do not commit themselves to anything for life. And just to mention one example, when I first started to work at the university, in 1988, I, I, I am a curious person, so I, I started my, my, my professional engagement by asking the students about 
what their dreams and plans of their future was. And um, they grew very pensive and very serious because this was a serious question. This was the question of their indefinite future, their, their whole working life where they start working will probably be the place where they will continue to work for, for years and decennia. There was the, the dominant model at that time was lifelong engagement. When I asked the same question of my students a few years ago, they also grew serious, but for a different reason, because they could not answer this question. They, they had no plans. They only had hopes, more or less desperate hopes. And these hopes concerned, well, a few months of time. So I stopped asking them. It was too sad. If you can't make plans as a person, if you can't commit yourself, then something is lost. And what is lost in the process is the future itself. And of course, this is also true about organizations. When I first studied management many, many years ago, corporations made long strategic plans for, for the next five years or so. And nowadays, <laughs> this, this sounds ridiculous because of course nobody can do that. The other thing we've lost is the past. It may sound strange, how do you lose the past? But there it is. We, due to this erosion of social structures, we've, we've uh, acquired a discontinuity of reality, of social reality. And one of the, the, the dogmas on which liquid modernity is founded, as, as Richard Sennett describes it, for example, is, is the, the assumption of flexibility. Originally, this word used to mean that something alters its form, alters its, its shape, temporarily flexibility, and then it come back, comes back to the, the original shape again. And nowadays, it means something else altogether. Flexibility came to mean an endless changing of shape. You have to be flexible, you have to be flexible. It means that you change your form all the time, all the time, and there is no coming back to the original form because nobody remembers what the original form was. And it causes a lot of pain because humans are, are really not <laughs> made to, to function this way. There is, there is no, no possibility to pause and be happy for work well done. There, there is no gratitude in this because there is nothing to look back to and compare with. We have to sell each other all the time. There is a marketplace and the marketplace is just about the present moment and about the selling pitch. So there is no time to actually do work because we are busy selling ourselves and presenting our facades and, and polishing our CVs all the time. This has very, very serious consequences for human beings and for the quality of work and for professions, for everything. But from the organizational point of view, it also is a disaster because this means that accountability is lost. We, we, we cannot account for our promises, our commitments, because there is nothing to compare these commitments with. The past is not relevant as an entity. And of course, it is very visible in politics, isn't it? And finally, we've lost mystery. Of course, 
solid modernity started on this path already when, when it promised that science would bring all the answers and nothing irrational would remain of human culture and civilization. But where we are now, we need to narrate everything we do, explain and, and legitimate everything we do, not just in quantitative terms. If you don't do that, you are not an adult member of society, but in financial terms. We, we've we've uh, acquired a state of almost complete financialization of social life. So when I was in school and somebody, hypothetically, because I've never met a person like that, would tell us about their dreams for their education and financial terms or about the the desire of having or not having kids in financial terms we would regard that person as a psychopath but nowadays everything is an investment isn't it and it also has to be narrated this way so this liquidity and th these are just three uh tendencies that there is much much more to it these this liquidity has produced a, a real erosion of society and it has very serious consequences we've come to a point where there really is no future and there there is a a, a growing awareness, especially among young people, among my students, who sometimes are quite active in, in organizations such as, or organizing movements such as Extension Rebellion, that something is very, very wrong and, and we are not just endangering ourselves, our, our, our mental and social health and our civilization and culture, but we're endangering the planet in, itself. So we've come to a point which, again, Sigmund Bauman, after Antonio Gramsci, calls the interregnum. And it's a, a moment in time of, of unknown length, where the old system has ceased to work. It, 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 it stopped functioning, it's dead, in other words. But a new system has not yet replaced it. It's, it's a, a period in between where everything is underdefined, everything is underdetermined. We don't know what will happen, maybe nothing at all. We really, really don't know that. What we are being told is that this is it. Take it or leave it, there is no alternative. but we would really, really need to find one now. So where we, do we go? Where, where to look for an alternative in a world where nothing works? And we're living in a kind of a zombie system. I would burn my right hand in a slow fire to change the future. I should do foolishly. The beauty of modern man is not in the persons, but in the disastrous rhythm, the heavy and mobile masses, the dance of the dream-led masses down the dark mountain. Wrote Robinson Jeffers in 1938. But the question returns, what should we do? Dream-led down the dark mountain or can we find can we make an alternative another rhythm the rhythm of breathing as before Baradi calls it we need to breathe well following all these sociological metaphors 
I, I'm proposing it, the metaphor of the sociological apocalypse. Because this is, this is really something that is being experienced on, on many levels and in, in many respects, both in everyday life, both of people living in society, see and experience the current times as times of massive destruction of everything that they believed in, everything they hoped for, and social structures which used to work but don't work anymore, even if they don't use the term. We have sociologists, philosophers, economists, poets, a, a lot of reflective professionals who also describe these processes as massively destructive. So this is one of the meanings of the apocalypse, destruction. Things fall apart, the center does not hold. On the other hand, if we look at the etymology, apocalypsis means revelation. Something is destroyed, something falls apart, but something is revealed. And what is revealed is the foundation on which those solid structures used to be constructed, on which they used to stand firmly in the past. They were invisible because there were things built upon it. So you could not see what the foundation was. You can now. Of course, you can if you train yourself to, to resist the, the almost irresistible power of this destruction, the, the things literally falling apart, things that you used to care for, that used to be important, the institutions that were bringers of trust and hope, and nowadays they reveal their really, really very ugly elements and signs. So they're among the debris falling in all directions nowadays. There is a lot of violence, there, there is a lot of raw power and treason and, and a sense of injustice. But there is also something else. There is something that we were learned or we were taught, taught that social structures and social institutions should be based upon the foundation of social structures should be shared values and they are there they are there they are not as visible as all this violence and 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 horrible things that come at us in the the process of destruction and erosion but they can be found and in 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 this book that you mentioned in, in my, my my book the after the apocalypse I propose that we start looking actively for these gold coins among the debris, the, the values. They are the, they need to be found. If we succeed in finding them, then we perhaps can build the new system upon them and not at whatever comes our way, not, not yet again on injustice and violence and greed but on these values specifically, and this will not happen all by itself. There is no dynamics leading in this direction. It all depends on us and it really does. It is up to us to find them and to use them well. And as an organization and management theorist, I, I, I propose to start looking for values that can help us to organize better workplaces, better enterprises, better social organizations and political ones and so on. Um, there are of course many, many other values that can be found and that should be used for a good purpose, but I'll, I'll concentrate just on these two. Because I happen to have read a few books and done some research about them. The first is solidarity. And the other is the common good, or the commons. As for solidarity, well, 
it's a state of grace. It comes and it goes, and we cannot manage it. We cannot organize it. It's beyond the scope of human ability to grasp. So we can just hope for it. But we need to be ready to see it when it comes. As for the common good, fortunately, there are many good examples of how to organize around it and how to make it a basis for, for work, for organizations, for enterprises, for political organizations, for all that kind of human collective activity. There, there is a, a lot of research and texts deriving from sociology, philosophy, and management theory, and many, many others that can show the direction how to do that. Unfortunately, many of us, if not most of us, are used to this notion of the tragedy of the commons. It's uh, become very popular, especially since the 1980s, as a justification why the commons don't work and they should be dismantled and everything should be privatized and made individual property because it is claimed Hardin has proven that the commons inevitably lead to impoverishment of the whole community sharing it. And this article has been called a discussion paradigm and it's it's been cited a, a, a huge number of times. There you see the value of much cited texts because this is simplistic and false. It has been refuted many times. So some of the articles citing this text are actually refuting it because the hardened metaphor is not only socially and culturally simplistic, it is historically false. And there is very good argumentation proving this. If anyone is interested, I recommend to read the text I refer to, for example. What management scientists such as myself and my co-author Alexander Rostovsky noticed, especially in, in the, the, the Hardin argument, is that it disregards completely from the central issue of management. The, the, the common good should be managed in a different way than the private good. Isn't that obvious? Well, it is to us, but not to many people who still believe in, in the Hardin story of the tragedy of the commons. What we do wrong is not embracing or reflecting or dreaming of the commons. What we do wrong is not being able to manage the commons as they should be managed. And this is no theory. It's not just theory. It's much more than that, which I will return to in a moment. So what Hardin presents is not so much the tragedy of the commons, but it's racket economics, a reckless exploitation of the land to the detriment of the community. And it's the, the, the onset of capitalism, as a, a Guy Standing beautifully and compellingly presents in his book from 2019 about the, the plunder of the comments, which I also wholeheartedly recommend to all of you. Instead, we perhaps should reconsider radically the whole idea and think in terms of the romance of the commons. Eleanor Ostrom, who, who was uh, the laureate of the uh, economics prize uh, dedicated to Alfred Nobel, uh, did quite a lot of good research on uh, the commons and their economic resilience uh, and also the, the way that they are organized in practice 
and they have their own rules managing common resources, including traditions, structures and cultural norms. So these organizations are aligned with the way that people structure the collaboration culturally and they are by necessity localized. They cannot be abstract global entities, huge global entities. They have to be fairly local. And now to the more practical points that I also have some arguments for the reconsidering of the role of the commons. It's in to be found in so-called alternative organizations. So it's not, in other words, it's not true that organizations of the common good do not exist or that they do not work. This is false. However, we very rarely find out about them because management departments and business schools and mass media only talk about a specific kind of organization. They, they talk about the corporation, the business corporation, which is run according to financialized principles, which is often owned by anonymous shareholders according to the so-called shareholder value principle. This is what is most visible. However, there is a whole ecosystem of organization around it, more and more marginalized, which we rarely see, rarely perceive, rarely talk about, and very, very rarely learn about in school or at university, which, which is known as alternative organizations. And among these alternative organizations, there are organizations of the common good, which I have studied since 2012, for, uh, for the last seven years. <clears throat> and I'm, of course, not the only one doing that. The, the, this kind of organization is being studied by, by many resources, including Martin Parker that I referred to just a moment ago. So th these are some citations from my uh, <clears throat> conversations with the organizers. The, the organizations are uh, economically viable, they, they are sustainable, they are resilient, they are rather small. Most of them are quite invisible for, for, from the point of view of, of mass media and even uh, business education, unfortunately. But I think they are quite interesting for many reasons, such as, for example, they build upon human relationship. Relationship and companionship are the, 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 the most important driving forces for people who engage in these organizations. They're, they are often, most typically, usually, they are organized as either cooperative or share, shared ownership or employee uh, shareholders uh, and so on. So they are really really inclusive and friendship is allowed to flourish uh, people are supposed to commit themselves to the the organization and to each other so they, they feel that they can depend on each other they can trust each other and they can trust their organization they are democratic, the, the, they are managed uh, on the basis of a horizontal principle and there is no hierarchical decision-making uh, structure, which of course makes decision-making very, very slow, but so what? It's much more solid, it's democratic, it's more fair, and, which is really important too, to which I shall come back in a moment, is that Thanks to this democratic horizontal principle, we get input from a large diversity of standpoints, from people who see things differently. There, there is no such thing as a silent minority, somebody who 
is not allowed to speak because that person is a minority, regarded as a minority, and therefore uh, regarded as someone who cannot take part in decision making. The majority principle is 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 really treated with uh, with uh, mm, some uh, consideration. It, I mean, it's not automatic. You try to, as an alternative organizer, you really try to find out what different people think, believe, and so on. People learn to organize by organizing. And this is, I think, quite an important citation, the second part. It's rather devastating, isn't it? They don't teach us that at school, at the uni. They teach entrepreneurship all the time. Competition, but not cooperation. And then they say, people can't. We need to teach ourselves. People get back their sense of agency, and it's also a form of work organization that does uh, a, a great thing for the, the work itself. It's a disalienated workplace. In other, other words, <clears throat> people feel at home in their work situation, which is very, very important, and not just for the, the person her or himself, but for the organization as such, it does wonders for quality, for relationships with the environment, and so on. But these examples are not the only ones. There are other examples as well. Some big enterprises used to, at least in the past, work on based on similar principles. Together with the co-author, Alexander Kostowski, we did a, a retrospective case study of an organization that worked in Poland in the 1970s, 80s, and even in the 1990s, which was based to a large part on the sense, at least the sense, the principle of the common good, even though there were a, a lot of uh, problems of different kinds for it, especially the state, which was very intrusive in that era, quite destructive towards local initiatives. But still, there was a sensation uh, among the people that uh, our company was a value, uh, a most important value, uh, a higher value. And self-interest should be subjugated to that value. There are also examples of organizations of the common good in, in other areas, such as economic activities and initiatives. Uh, uh, Zofia Wapniewska, Polish economist, uh, does a, a really fascinating studies of such initiatives, uh, energy cooperatives and so on, and it, it all works well. And then we have urban commons and inclusivity in architecture and in city planning, for example, uh, architect Krzysztof Nawratek writes about such initiatives in, in different parts of the world. So this, this is not limited to small uh, cooperatives that I have been studying, even though as my, my, my uh, ethnographic focus, they, they are quite interesting, fascinating for me, but there are many, many other examples. What all these examples are, are based on is the principle of alternative management, <clears throat> management for the common good, which is a, a mixture of things that rem, rem, remind us a bit of private and of public institutions, but it's a mixture of both. It's, it's neither and it's both. And because they are based on values, shared higher values, they make ideologies and market dogmas quite unnecessary. And they are both simpler and firmer. They are based directly on other institutions working through culture and trust. And at the same time, they are structurally very complex to be, uh, uh, to, to embrace all that diversity and to be democratic. And they are quite, quite, uh, empowered by being in accordance with 
some of the important important principles of the human condition. And this is no novelty. It's not even a, a, a shocking new discovery. It's something that has existed and management, even management theories, such as a prominent management thinker, Henry Mintzberg, writes about, especially in his, he does that very, very clearly in his uh, most recent book, Better Time Stories for, for Managers. Um, he says in, in one of his podcasts, management is not about narcissism, it's about community ship. So this is uh, something quite uh, fundamental, it, not just about human condition, but also about the condition of management, what it is and how it should be done. So what we have is again the returning and very pertinent question of management and for management. What we're doing, how we're doing it, what for we're doing it. And the question of efficiency, the last one, which our current era tends to focus on exclusively disregarding from the first three. Those of you who look at this slide and think, ha, Aristotle, yeah, that's it. There are four causes for, for action and not just one. And if you reduce everything to efficiency, then you get exactly the situation we have now, which according to Henry Mintzberg, is not even management, even though we have managerialized everything and we have omnipresent management talk everywhere, in mass media, in universities, in, in places where it never belonged before, like churches, like art, like uh, politics, everything. But it's not even management, says Henry Mintzberg, who knows, because he's uh, one of the, the founding uh, stages and researchers of contemporary management. Going even further and thinking about the consequences and the implications of all this, it's not just about the workplace and it's of course not just about the uh, managers and management, but it's, it's about, well, returning to the, to the starting point of this, this lecture about the crisis, about the interregnum and uh, here uh, we come to uh, the thought of Edgar Morin, the philosopher, his most recent book uh, about the lessons from the crisis, from the current COVID-19 crisis, the lockdown. It teaches us a lot about ourselves, about very, very fundamental things, such as our human condition, our civilization, uh, the awakening of solidarities. And it can, but unfortunately, uh, it's just a possibility that we can grasp if we really try. So it can teach us some very important and timely lessons of what to look for, where to look for it, what to try to achieve when all this is over, when the, when the, uh, I, I really like the French expression, <clears throat> the crise sanitaire, the, 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 the crisis of public health in, instead of the pandemic, because I'm not a, um, an epidemiologist, I'm, I'm just a social scientist. So I prefer to think in terms of crisis because crisis provokes to new solutions, to rethinking, to re-evaluating things, and hopefully, hopefully finding new solutions. And one of these new solutions, a, a promising direction, is uh, basing more of what we do together our organizations, 
on the common good, on the principle of the common good, because it turns out that the common good responds quite well to two important characteristics of human togetherness. First of all, the impulse of sociality, the, the, the human condition, but also the complexity of the environment. The environment has grown extremely complex nowadays. And at the same time, we don't know how to deal with it. And instead of dealing with it, instead of responding to the complexity, we are simplifying and reducing our responses to the, 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 the most rudimentary ones, which are not just not solving these problems, they are aggravating them. And they, they produce a, 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 a spiral of a destructive, self-destructive spiral of responses uh, of the type more of the same. If something is a problem, then more of the same. If the market is a problem, then more of the same. If pollution is the problem, then find market solutions to pollutions and pollute even more because this is the only way that this system is able to conceive of any cause and effect relationships based on reductionism. And these days we do another Thing, simplifying thing, we try to go back to the past, which is something which is plainly impossible. So management, to sum up, to wrap up and to come to the end of, of this lecture, management for the common good offers both a simplification and a recognition of complexity at the same time, and it's already there and it's working. So why not grab it and do something massive with it? Even if it's in the margins now, but what to do after the apocalypse? Reclaim the commons. Thank you. much uh, for a, a very interesting informative and inspiring speech now do we have any questions from the audience now i have a very short question uh, i'm just wondering why uh, cooperatives and different alternative businesses or organizations uh, are not becoming more and more popular why they are not becoming popular yeah more popular um well, I think it, the, the part of the, the, the problem is that the, mm, well, there are, there are many problems. I will not address some of them here, but there, there's one thing I think we could do. Uh, it's due to the breakdown of relationships. Again, social relationships that used to exist between practitioners, organizers, academics, researchers on the one hand, and the mass media on, on the other hand. This, this relationship has broken down. So the, the, the journalist, even those who would want to present that kind of mm, phenomena, they, they are cut off from the information, cut off from the sources of, of this information, and they, they are only in touch with, with the center, the, uh, the corporate uh, shareholder value center. And it's extremely difficult because they don't have time, they don't have, usually they, they don't have the, uh, the, the, the knowledge where to look or, or how to discern something serious from something completely irrational and unserious. That's a consequence from that. So we who do, who are organizers or researchers dealing with that kind of organization, we should try to approach journalists and make friends with them, good friends. Uh, thank you for for uh, for this wonderful lecture. Uh, I really enjoyed the historical overview of uh, of uh, what uh, uh, like we were involved uh, in uh, uh, in the past. Uh, uh, so uh, I've got a question uh, that is related to uh, the issue of solidarity because you described uh, solidarity as a um, state of grace that. Uh, 
uh, that we are uh, looking forward to and that's uh, uh, going to um, to happen like uh, 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 s someday uh, so there is this simple uh, question uh, and probably it, uh, it is motivated by the activist like in me, like how to make it happen. <laughs> because uh, like uh, uh, solidarity can be achieved uh, like in many, many groups. Uh, and some of the groups uh, can be very, can be based or can be organized around very conservative traditional, like patriarchal, homophobic, or um, misogynic uh, mm, um, uh, factors. So they uh, can be, uh, they can uh, express solidarity, however, only to those who they considered worthy of their solidarity. So uh, to those who are, um, uh, 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 who, who are kind of them, who are made uh, uh, according to uh, to their image uh, what about uh, intersectional solidarity how to um, make it happen i know that this sounds uh, rather sim maybe simplistic <laughs> like uh, but, um, but but yeah but 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 uh, how to uh, how to help uh, this kind of uh, um, intersectional solidarity uh, 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 happen uh, around us. Uh. Thank you. I think it's a, a very good question. It, it, it's it's really a, an interesting question. Uh, I have no answer. Uh, I, I believe in, in inviting solidarity. You, know, you, you can invite solidarity when you're open towards your fellow human being. But uh, philosopher and poet Franco Bifo Bernardi uh, ha, ha, has written uh, a few interesting texts about this issue. And he says the following, where, where we have a small group isolated, be it traditionalistic or very progressive, based on a shared identity, then you don't invite solidarity because it's based on similarity. <clears throat> so you exclude others by being similar. However, because solidarity is not based on being similar, being identical, but solidarity is being different, uh, being human, basically being human and looking forward to some goal or aim which is larger than ourselves. And here I think the, the idea of the common good comes in ideally, because if we believe in a higher value, we, we don't mind the other being different from us. The, the higher value that unites us becomes more important than the difference between us. And this it's also sounds idealistic, but I've seen it at work. I've seen it several times. I've been there. And it, it really does, it, it really has this effect. It's a, a, a powerful feeling which changes everything, basically. And of course, you can't hold on to it. That's why I, I, I think... Solidarity cannot be managed, uh, it, but it can be constantly invited into our lives and into our organizations. Okay, thank you. Can I uh, say we have another question from an online public. Uh, how to persuade the managers of organizations, but also the citizens to draw conclusions from the current crisis, but also to take uh, real action uh, is this uh, at all possible? Well, this is really a big question. Well, part of the answer is is uh, that we should make very, very good friends with journalists because they are the ones who have access to managers of organizations and the citizens uh, and if there is a possibility to carry our our uh, questions, ideas, and uh, to invite a discussion, I think they have the most possibility to to, to start such such a discussion. The other thing we can do, of course, is if we are teachers or organizers, we can we can arrange discussions and conversations around this topic. 
and be open to all kinds of positions and all kinds of, of responses because people obviously are different and we have to be res able to respect that. Um, what else can we do? We can, we can, we can demonstrate. We can um, protest and we can resist. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm curious if you also see some possibilities of for graphic design in this, because you say about journalists and graph what about graphic designers? Uh, graphic designers uh, mm -hmm. who create uh, visual communication around us. I mean, others uh, advertising also, but oh, yeah. uh, mm, uh, infographic uh, uh, information design. Yeah, that's a wonderful suggestion. I, I, I haven't thought of that, but of, of course, yes, absolutely. If there is a possibility at all to come in, because it's it's been all taken over by big corporations and by, by a standard um, advertising function, which seduces us in, into doing things that we really don't want to continue doing. But in, in the 1990s, which is not so so very very uh, long uh, such a, it's not such a distant past uh, some of the advertisements were quite beautiful because uh, they were created by artists and i don't know if that's possible at all nowadays but maybe we could try to have some kind of impact here i mean those of us who are designers or those of us who know designers or artists to 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 make well to get get a foot in the door at least a few months ago we read um, a mind blowing art article uh, a mind blowing uh, interview with you in one of the leading uh, polish newspapers uh, in which you criticize the way uh, management is uh, taught at uh, at the university level the western countries and so i'm uh, wondering uh, are there any or have there been any changes any kind of hopeful positive changes in the teaching of uh, management uh, in uh, uh, in the uh, in the countries which uh, most uh, closely embraced neoliberal policies, uh, like after uh, uh, have, have there been any changes after the crisis or uh, like mm -hmm. nowadays? Uh, in in in, in uh, uh, ones of the most fervent uh, 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 adherents to neoliberal uh, policies uh, in the Western world. Uh, because uh, yeah, w we could see a lot of negative, uh, negative things happening. But uh, uh, um, what about hopeful ones? Uh, ho hopeful mo modifications of the management teaching and uh, bringing uh, up uh, a whole new generation of uh, economists, um, seeing things in a different light, in a different way. Uh, 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 opening uh, towards a diverse economies approach, uh, feminist economics, uh, um, uh, yeah, like kind of left wing economics. Well, it, it's perhaps a bit difficult because we lack the technology. The technology that we use in this time of crisis is uh, has been created for corporations, for corporate use, not for academic use, most of it. So it, it's, it's really difficult to, to uh, do new things, immersive and inclusive, using platforms such as the ones that we are, well, uh, we are, uh, we have to use now. Uh, we, we don't have we don't have uh, the space to create new forms of teaching, although there are places, of course, where this, this kind of space has been created. And I know personally at, at least two uh, where, where people have for the, the last semester, one in Poland and one in France, 
where people have been for the last semester been allowed to do an, a kind of a professional experiment and trying to find new forms of teaching that is inclusive and immersive even though it's online. Um, so the, 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 the question is not final. I mean, the, my answer is not final. It's something that is happening. It's something that is in process. And I believe the, what I see, from what I see, uh, the, some of the trends are quite positive and promising, but some, some very depressing things are also going on, especially in the university world, which has been, uh, has been uh, subjected to the, the most heavy pressures of businessification, and I mean the Anglo-Saxon world. world. The, the, but in, uh, I, th I think I can mention two things. First, first of all, there are local initiatives. So in, there are places, uh, as I said, about in France and in Poland, as far as I know, uh, also in Sweden, where uh, where people test new ideas and where there are more discussion, more openness to, and, and consciousness, awareness about these issues that, that cause the crisis and possibilities to to um, do something different in a better way in the future. Um, the other thing is a bit more global. It's a network that has been active since uh, some time now. And it's, it's rooted mostly in, in Germany and in the US. It's known as a humanistic management network. And they have, they have uh, small hubs in many different countries, including Poland. And as it happens, the, the Polish hub is the the oldest one, <laughs> we've been first with humanistic management, the Institute of Culture uh, uh, in Krakow. Uh, it's, it's been created in, in the mid 1990s by Professor Orzechowski. It, it was a, a glorious idea from the beginning. Uh, the, the, and there are quite many um, very constructive things um, going on within this, the frame of this, this network. Um, and I, I think they've, they've become the humanistic management network. They, they become bolder during the crisis. They, they, they are present in media and they, they, they talk about possible solutions about the, the reasons for abandoning the old model more loudly than before. So yes, there, there are things happening both locally and globally, and I hope there will be more of them, and it depends on us. What about Wikimedia, uh, Wikipedia and Wikimedia sister projects uh, that endured for 20 years now as only non-commercial websites in the top 20 webs, especially as real utopia as assumed by sociologist Eric Olin Wright? Well, uh, beginning with the from the end, uh, I, I don't recall right uh, using the example of Wikipedia as a, as a living utopia. He he was uh, uh, writing about cooperative movements and mainly and <clears throat> social organizations. Um, I'm not a Wikipedia expert, but I, I believe it's uh, it's interesting, certainly, but it's uh, not a utopia in itself. It's a side effect of the marginalization of the common good, uh, which used to be uh, uh, professionally assembled knowledge, such as Encyclopedia Britannica and other encyclop encyclopedias projects, which were uh, the effect of the collaboration of 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 uh, very knowledgeable professionals. So um, I, I would be a bit uh, cautious uh, with uh, using this example. Although it's of course always good when people collaborate for um, uh, for a, a a good reason, non commercial in this case. Um, also, it has been, for example, in David Graeber's book, uh, 
bullshit jobs it has been uh, he has um, observed that people who have uh, really excruciatingly uh, pointless jobs tend to occupy themselves with something that they feel is meaningful and wikipedia is one of them so it's a, it's a so solution for some people to endure uh, work processes which are uh, very difficult to endure otherwise um which platform to use is an, a question i cannot answer i'm not a technologist so i uh, i think we should collaborate with it people and tell them our needs more about our needs uh, and of course students should take a very active part because it's it's the students who who are really disadvantaged in this uh, online teaching experiment uh, they they they've lost uh, agency uh, to a very very high degree due to some of the platforms the corporate platforms being used and i don't want to mention any names because <laughs> um i i don't feel inclined to making positive or negative advertisement for these uh, these platforms but i think we should we should try to create achieve platforms for pedagogical use that we are happy with and are of course our students are happy with as well okay again me uh what do you think about the, Mo the, the, the Spanish Mondragon Cooperative? Uh, because, uh, uh, like, I wrote my uh, my PhD on the um, uh, contemporary reinterpretation of Marxism and anarchism, and uh, so I got through uh, like a lot of uh, uh, leftist uh, uh, articles and books. Uh, about uh, the changes in uh, uh, economics or about uh, economic organizations and a lot of uh, mm, theorists and uh, mm, uh, yeah theorists they were not really mm, uh, mm, saying much about or writing much about uh, this uh, Spanish cooperative and I was really I was always really astounded uh, because it is uh, presented as a great uh, management success uh, especially uh, among the theorists and activists from the diverse uh, economics approach but uh, with uh, rather mm, traditional or um, uh, 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 those who call themselves kind of radically leftist uh, uh, writers, it, it is not so popular. They rather uh, consider it as part of uh, um, the um, neoliberal kind of capitalistic uh, 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 um, changes uh, of the modern world. Uh, so, what is your take on on, on this uh, on, on this cooperative? Well, generally, it's always good with cooperatives. So, so as long as something re remains a cooperative, uh, retains the structure, the cooperative structure, it can be much more easily democratized. And th the same is true about the collegial structure, even if it goes all pathological and feudal, but it's basically there, then it can be brought back again to a more democratic form, much, much easier than if, if it, it gets turned into a um a corporate structure hierarchical corporate hierarchical structure so mm, the first my first reaction is positive in that sense it it's re it has retained the capability for doing something democratic but uh, i agree with you or the 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 authors that you referred to that it has changed recently and it is it is being run as if it were a corporation, even if it's not a corporation, it's being run as if it were a corporation. And this is due to a mechanism known as isomorphism in institutional theory, which means that organizations, social institutions tend to imitate each other. And it, it's not a, a, a trivial thing. It's not uh, something that uh, you do because you, you, you like imitating others or you, you lack fantasy it's uh, 
uh, an important institutional mechanism. This is how societies work, and especially in times where where the the, the margins get cut off, like in our times, where there is no slack and you know, everything is subdued to very harsh mechanisms of competition and survival. It's, it's either swim or sink, there is no other way. So the, the many organizations, especially large ones who are forced into international markets are, are made or made or make themselves look like uh, the, the, the corporations, the, the financialized Mm, uh, corporations that they in the beginning wanted to differentiate themselves from. In other words, Mandragon and uh, other organizations like them, such as John Lewis, there is a, a really good paper by, by Hugh Wilmot and John Lewis, have originally started out as, as uh, cooperatives, uh, democratic, but uh, are working right now as if they were um, corporations, financialized corporations, because uh, they are too large. They operate in the global competitive market and they, they are sub subjected to, to isomorphism, even though they may be, possibly, probably, many people there would are not welcoming these changes. And this, this often includes the decision makers, the, the managers themselves tend to, to be quite unhappy with these uh, tendencies, but they will repeat the slogan, there is no alternative. So why the organizations that I have been studying are alternative is a matter of radical choice all of them, and that was the basis of my selection of organizations to study, all of them are defining themselves as working outside of capitalism, which, which means that they, they, there are many things they won't do, that they don't engage with. Uh, there are uh, privileges that they do not take part in. So this is very inconvenient. They cannot grow, but on the other hand, it's good because it, they, it turns out that uh, the organizations of this kind should not grow too much. They can be networking with each other, but they shouldn't be too large because human relationships require at least that you recognize the people that you work with and so on. So uh, to, to, to cut this answer shorter, uh, this is a tendency which is quite quite dominant nowadays, the, the isomorphism, working as if one were a corporation, but it's not irreversible in the, in the case of Mandragon, I think, at least. Uh, thank you very much. As we are coming to the end of the session, I would like to thank you very much for a wonderful speech, inspiring speech, and all the answers to, to the questions from the public. Thank you very much for participation. Thank you all very, very much. Thank you. And see you, see you again after the break. Thank you.